So what we'll be doing for this module over the next few weeks is using a methodology called textual analysis. And you've no doubt had some experience of this in other units, perhaps the first year metering communication units. Textual analysis, as I've noted in the study notes, is something that's been rejected by some of the proponents of Media Studies 2.0. And I started to make a justification for it in the study notes. But what I thought I'd do is also talk to someone who's a familiar face to you in this unit about this issue. Okay, I'm speaking to Dr. Deb Waterhouse Watson, who gave a lecture for us recently on digital media and the law. Deb, I was wondering if you could give us your definition and explanation of what textual analysis is. Textual analysis, it's about finding meanings in text. Finding, there's not one definitive meaning because texts are polysemic, means they have multiple meanings, multiple possible readings, but it is about finding a meaning from a text. And you gestured there to the potential limitations of textual analysis. I'm wondering if you can say something more about that, but also about the potentialities of it. Well, one limitation of textual analysis is that it is always subjective. It will always be influenced by our personal biases um, and one person's interpretation. One person's analysis might be quite different from somebody else's, which doesn't necessarily mean that either one is invalid. What textual analysis does allow is for a critical reading of a text and the ways that it might uh, position an audience that's below the level of consciousness, so that people aren't necessarily going to be aware of. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this is that you're currently an associate lecturer at Monash in an interdisciplinary position of literary, English literature and media studies, so you are perfectly situated to respond to this quotation. I'm going to read out a quotation which you haven't heard before from David Gauntlet's Kindle book, a uh, very recent publication. He writes that, Quote, a focus on the meaningful and sociological side of media studies also means that we are required to discourage the self-indulgent and pointless textual analysis which was once central to the average media studies textbook. Occasionally some commentators do manage to make interesting observations about the composition or meaning of a particular cult culturally significant text, but requiring our students to make pretentious statements about trivial aspects of unimportant bits of media content was always a silly idea and bound to draw sharp and reasonable attacks from critics of the discipline. The defense that this activity is parallel to what they do in literature studies was correct, but it's often a waste of time there too. So what is your response uh, off the cuff? I know you haven't been prepared for this. What is your response to that kind of sentiment? Um, well, probably my facial expression was fairly um, explanatory there. Um, this kind of laughter. I mean, to suggest that literary studies as a discipline is completely worthless. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's suggesting that, you know, people should just write literature without having any understanding of how texts work, without having un any understanding of what the conventions of literature are. And textual analysis, that's one of the things that it does. It's looking at the conventions of uh, constructing texts and making meaning. Um, and that's one of the things that's really critical for people who create great literature, who create really great texts. They understand how they work. And unpacking it through textual analysis is a really key way of being able to do that. And that would be the case with some world-renowned authors, I imagine. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Emily Dickinson, great reader. Um, I'm not a massive fan of James Joyce, but he is um, renowned as as an, uh, an incredibly great writer. Again, a really great reader. The Bronte sisters, um, Charlotte, Emily, Anne, were prolific readers and critical readers, which is the key. They didn't just um, read books for the fun of it. Uh, they talked about them, they unpacked them, they took them apart as well. So it's a really critical part of creating texts. Thank you very much. A key concept we're looking at this week is ideology. And to give you a definition of this, I'd like to quote Adam Brown from 2012, who wrote that ideology is a collection or system of views and values shared by a certain group of people. By the way, if you're doing some early Christmas shopping, please do consider this book. That's a very broad definition, and there's lots of different uh, theoretical conceptualizations of what ideology is. It often has negative connotations. We're not necessarily thinking that way here. No text is ideologically neutral. Everything generates meanings, often in utopian and dystopian ways, when it represents digital media. And we're going to look at various forms of cultural representations this week, and here's a few examples.
M.T. Anderson's science fiction novel Feed, as you can see on the front cover, is based on people having microchips implanted in their heads from a very young age. And essentially the, revolves, the plot revolves around a, a group of young teenagers who are going about their everyday lives, shopping, they go into shops and it's kind of like Minority Report if you've seen the Steven Spielberg film in a way with Tom Cruise, that they go into shops and whatever they look at they get in advertisements injected straight into their minds relating to that based on preferences and so on. They also have uh, essentially a social media function where they have instant messaging um, conversations straight into their minds without actually speaking, they just think to each other. So it's a really uh, complex representation of a future with technology that's gone wild in a sense. And the representation of the users of this technology is very critical uh, about young people in contemporary day because as we know all uh, fiction about the future is actually about the present. And what's happened to these people in the book is that their language has deteriorated. They say things like, like, a lot, which could sound a little bit familiar, but it's, it goes beyond that. And I'll just read out a paragraph from a chapter here, uh, which really shows the kind of uh, negative representation of the impacts of uh, these microchips, the feeds, but really it's, it's about social media in terms of this novel. School, TM, is not so bad now. Not like back when my grandparents were kids when the schools were run by the government, which sounds completely like Nazi to have the government running the schools. Back then it was big boring, and all the kids were megnal because they didn't learn anything useful. It was like blah, 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 blah. This happened in 1492, da, 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 da. When you mix like chalk and water, it makes nitroglycerin and that kind of shit. And nothing was useful. And so the novel's ideological representation of young people is inherently negative. All they care about these days is shopping, going on holiday, um, taking various kinds of substances and so on. What's not important anymore is education. Indeed, the whole educational system has been bankrupted of meaning by social media, uh, or at least through the metaphor of the feed. The whole world runs on the feed in this novel. And that's one really interesting uh, representation which critiques contemporary digital media. And now, let's have a look at film. When it comes to the subject of film, there is just so much that we could talk about. This is particularly the case with fiction films, although you might also like to think about documentary films you've seen. I've gestured to a number of examples in the latest study notes document, but I'm sure you've seen many more in the last year alone that could be talked about in relation to the portrayal of digital media culture. One film that I wanted to briefly focus on here is Alan Rifkin's 2007 film, Look. And this film is designed to appear as if it's screened entirely through CCTV, surveillance camera footage. And what Look does is essentially combine the narratives, dramatised, fictionalised narratives, of a group of people. And these narratives intersect to some extent throughout the film. The opening titles of the film state that, quote, there are an estimated 30 million surveillance cameras in the United States generating more than 4 billion hours of video every week. On any given day, the average American is captured approximately 200 times. And what's really interesting about this is if I went to the special features and listened to the director's commentary, and the director noted that his motivation for this film is actually drawn from an experience he had when he ran a red light camera and that camera took a picture of him. That picture was sent to him in the mail. And he was, to quote him from the, the commentary, he was unnerved that I could be photographed without my knowledge. So that experience made this director think, okay, this is some a different way that I could tell a story. How often, he started to, started to actually notice how often people are being videoed constantly at every single time, moment of the day in lots of different places. Now, we don't often have uh, a, an apparent intention of a filmmaker uh, to look at in relation to a film, and it's not really important what the intention of a filmmaker is. But I find it ironic in this film that the director seems to be so unnerved by surveillance, but at the same time, this film basically reinforces the necessity of surveillance. So what this film does is provide a series of dramatised narratives uh, of people who sometimes meet in the film but are usually going about their everyday lives. 
And what's really significant about this film, which on the surface seems to be critiquing the all-pervasiveness and problematic nature of camera surveillance in society, it actually reinforces it. And the way that it does that is shows all of these characters, without exception throughout the film, undertaking various kinds of immoral or uh, corrupt or criminal behaviour. They're misbehaving in all different kinds of ways. You've got car accidents where uh, drivers driving dangerously hit another car and then speed off. This is captured on camera. There is also adultery. There is shoplifting. There is sexual harassment in the workplace. There are people who have sex or masturbate or uh, take drugs in the, the stock room of a big store while they're supposed to be helping customers. There's a pedophile who goes around stalking a young child and eventually kidnaps her. There's also cases, a case where a high school teacher has sex with one of his students in, the, in his car in the school parking lot at night and then he's captured via security camera and taken to the police station where he's filmed there too during the interrogation process. So without exception, this film is showing deviant or criminal behaviour uh, and how that's captured on camera. And the viewer is given a strong sense when they think about it that this is kind of, as much as it's disturbing to watch, at least it's been captured on camera. So it's actually under the surface, this film that's supposed to be critiquing surveillance is reinforcing the necessity of capturing this deviant and criminal behaviour, this misbehaviour on film. Oh, and by the way, if you thought that it was enough just having a film of look, you've also now got the TV series. You can kind of see from the cover what kind of voyeuristic intent, just like the film this series has. Now we'll move on to a medium of a different sort, console games.